So I'm presenting some work with uh, my colleagues Andrew Selps and Manish Raghavan. Manish is actually here, so you should also find him. Uh, there he is. Um, so actually I'll be picking up on some topics already discussed, which is specifically some of the assumptions behind these approaches to explanations called counterfactual explanations. And as we point out in the paper, counterfactual explanations as an, as an approach actually resembles a style of explanation that exists in the United States under US credit laws, uh, which require that when someone is subject to an adverse decision, that they are given reasons for that adverse decision. So something like your income was insufficient um, tends to be more general than the counterfactual explanations we've just heard about, like you need to make X amount more money. Um, but what we're trying to do in this paper is actually uh, explore some of the assumptions that are often hidden behind the presumed utility uh, of these approaches. And I want to point out that the main feature of this approach is that you don't have to disclose the model in its entirety. So this is not desc des uh, describing the algorithm. Instead, it's holding up a subset, a limited set of features that are deemed most relevant to the decision. Did I do it right? Okay. Um, this is a very attractive approach for a number of reasons. Uh, it seems to place no constraints on model complexity. We don't even be concerned with whether un anyone can understand the model itself. Um, because you don't have to disclose the model in its entirety, there's a sense that you can protect intellectual property, limit gaming. Um, it seems, in some sense, to provide a justification or maybe instructions for achieving a different outcome. It can even automate the process of, of generating explanations. And as we heard a moment ago, it might also be seen as a way of complying with the law. Um, but we'll try to point out, and the paper we put out four, and the talk I'll point out three, uh, assumptions that are often uh, taken for granted, but actually I think significantly uh, undermine the kind of expe expected utility of, of these approaches. So one is that the form of explanation takes often is the, of the type that says, change this particular feature by this amount, increase your income by X amount. But in the real world, uh, there often isn't a perfect correspondence between the feature change you want to make and an action in the, that you can take to change that feature. And most of the work to date, uh, that mapping has often been pretty clear, but we can think of many examples where that's not the case. So for example, here's a very simple credit scoring model, which is based on income and length of employment. And you might imagine that you want to choose between telling someone to make more money or to have a longer length of employment. Um, but the available actions would be something like getting a higher paying job, which would simultaneously affect both their income and their length of employment. And in, in fact, in this case, could even increase their income beyond what you told them, um, but actually push you back in terms of your length of employment. Um, and so this is a very simple way of showing not only that features may be uh, non-independent, uh, but they can actually have the effect of making it difficult to isolate uh, the feature you want to change, given the limited set of actions you actually have in the real world. Um, and it may well be that when people are trying to tell us that we should be giving actual explanations, which is actually a, a lovely paper from last year, what they're really trying to tell us is that we should, be only, we should only instruct people to do things for which there is something causally plausible in the real world for them to do. Um, but this requires actually thinking extremely carefully about what mechanisms exist, what actions are actually possible for someone to take in the real world. Um, and in some sense, gaming is even just a special case of this exact problem. When we worry about gaming, what we're worried about is that there might be some action that the decision maker hasn't even thought about that would allow you to actually change the features in the instructed way, but do it with a set of actions that are not sort of what you expect, uh, to, uh, expect in order to make that change. The second assumption we look at is that features are often um, hard to compare to each other. How do you actually decide whether to emphasize that income is the relevant one or length of employment? These are often incommensurate. There's no natural way to compare these things. And so traditionally, in much of this work, there's been a, an effort to normalize looking at the distribution of the training data. So how do we actually scale this in a way that treats them in a sort of similar fashion? Um, and you can see that by simply scaling things slightly differently, this is a very trivial example, we can actually switch what would be the more obvious thing to emphasize if what we're interested in is telling someone what's the least amount of effort you'd have to invest. And so the scaling issue is profound. This will radically change the kinds of explanations you give. Um, of course, the problem is that the distribution of the data is not in any meaningful sense related to the difficulty of performing the task in the real world. Often the, the true cost of making a change that would affect the feature it's, it's very uh, hard to know and it's not at all represented in the data itself. Um, and further, it may be the case that the cost of making the kind of change that you're suggesting varies not just by feature, but by person. The cost for me to make a change might be very different from a cost for someone else to, to make. And then the third thing we wanted to point out is that um, features can often be relevant to more than the one decision at hand. Um, so for example, the same set of features like income uh, might be important to your credit uh, score, 
But income is also relevant to many other aspects of your life because it's an input to lots of other decisions. And so there's a way in which this can have kind of interesting spillover effects. So it may be the case that um, changing a feature is not only beneficial for this one decision, but also many other de decisions in your life. Or it could be that it's good in this one area, but actually harmful in another. And in fact, if we think about some of the concerns that people have around uh, avoiding sort of irrational or harmful explanations, like for instance, telling someone potentially to make less money because that would allow them in some possible you know, hypothetical to gain access to credit, what we're really saying is that it only is rational with respect to this one decision when in, and with respect to these other areas of our life. Of course, that's irrational. Um, and I think this is a, a, a kind of demonstration that it's hard to be able to kind of separate out the relevance of these features to the decision at hand alone. And so ideally what we would want to be able to do is help people identify when there's positive spillover so they can actually make decisions that have sort of value across multiple domains and to avoid these negative spillovers. But the decision maker who's tasked with giving this explanation will often not have that information. Um, and it's also going to be possible that because people have other life goals, they will actually make changes to features that are included in the model, but are not disclosed as particularly relevant to the decision because they weren't in some sense dispositive or kind of the influential feature, but still nevertheless play the role. Um, and unless, other pe unless people are told not to change those features, it's very well that they'll have other reasons in their life to do so. Okay, in the remaining, let's see, minute and 30 seconds, we talk about three tensions that arise from this, and the paper is certainly not meant to be a way of suggesting that these are unhelpful, um, but there's some challenges here, and some of these are sort of just um, fundamental tensions in how to navigate this. So, one, um, in many respects, you know, what is the alternative to this approach? You can seem, you could think that maybe what we want to do is disclose the model to entirety, but in many respects, that doesn't really respect people's autonomy. What can you do with an explanation, with a model that you don't understand, right? And so in some sense, these are ways of trying to be respectful of people's autonomy while recognizing that certain choices have to be made on their behalf. I mean, in the paper, we actually talk about some instances where this is often the case, like when you seek out expert advice of a lawyer or accountant or so on. And so you can think about situations where relinquishing agency allows someone to get uh, kind of an explanation uh, that serves their best interests. Um, but that's not always the case, and you have to think carefully about when that's true. Um, we can also uh, think about the degree to which the decision maker is given a significant amount of latitude to actually figure out how to provide such, such explanations. And in the best case, this might be seen as kind of a beneficent paternalism, where you're actually trying to you know, tell the person what is, you think is in their best interest. But at worst, this actually leaves a lot of room for them to be um, engaged in a form of self-dealing, where they give explanations that are in the interest of the, of the, of the decision maker, like, here's the way you can get credit at an interest rate that will be particularly profitable to me, rather than at the interest rate that you, that you might want. And the final point is that eventually, even if we can think of ways to try to compensate for this, like for instance, and you'll hear many excellent papers later today and tomorrow about giving other styles of explanations, diverse explanations, providing people with um, interactive simulations, and even soliciting user inputs, um, the worry here is that ultimately this will, as we heard in the first presentation on this panel, uh, risk actually disclosing enough for people to reconstruct the model. Um, and in, in that case, these become much less attractive to the decision makers that we want to use them. So I'll stop right there. Thanks.